Italian conference in logic, you've almost made it. Uh, there are a few hurdles still on, on the way, uh, especially I would like to remind you the General Assembly for the Italian Association, AILA, um, this afternoon and tomorrow a very special session carry on in, in Italian for the delight of our foreign visitors um, about the research in logic uh, in Italy. But today we begin the works uh, with, uh, with a talk from a, a, a logician who knows and uh, has experienced the problems that a, an association for logic may have. He served as uh, president for the British Logic Colloquium for six years, having been vice president for a very long time before that, and uh, I don't know how he managed, at the same time being the head of the uh, prestigious Department of Pure and uh, uh, of the Department of Pure Mathematics and uh, Mathematical Statistics in Cambridge. Uh, Professor Martin Highland will take the stage to speak about models for type theory. Thank you. Very much. Um, usually on occasions like this, uh, I feel a certain inhibition because it's customary to thank people for, hi really, Nice to see you. <laughs> it's customary to thank people for the invitation to speak. And I never quite feel thankful for an invitation to speak as such. On the other hand, I am very thankful for the invitation to be here because it's been an extraordinary pleasure to meet so many young Italian magicians. The scale of this meeting is absolutely extraordinary. And I want to say to the people of my generation how lucky I think you all are to have so many talented and enthusiastic students, postdocs, and younger colleagues here. So, you're lucky people. Um, you can see that uh, this talk is being given with a, in a kind of experimental mode with hypermodern technology. Uh, this is a suggestion by my friend uh, Phil Scott, who has seen me writing slides by hand relentlessly and kind of resisting the computer for so many years. And he suggested that it's possible to do it this way. And we'll see whether it works. Um, I fear some of the slides will be uh, kind of less than ideal because my writing is, frankly, I think. The older you get, the worse your writing gets at some stage. There must be a peak around age eight where you <laughs> form your letters, right? <laughs> so on. Okay, so the purpose of this talk is in, in some very general sense, I want to kind of, I want to demystify what has become perhaps an over, um, an over, an over-promoted side of logic. Um, but I'm going to talk about something that's, that's interesting to me, which is models of type theory. Um, so there. The plan of the talk, I'm going to say something about type theories. Then I'll say something about categorical model theory as a kind of general, I mean, one of a number of general ways of thinking abstractly about logic. And then I'll describe a modern perspective on models of type theory, and then I'll sketch a weird model that I've been investigating with a student in Cambridge. And then I'll say something about this issue of functional extensionality, and then I'll say something about the dialectical interpretation so everybody can see that, like so many logicians, I kind of pin myself to girdle, and um, that means I must be okay, really, or something like that. Okay. So, here are a few, a few dates in type theory. Uh, if you're doing this in a professional way, you would put in a lot of other dates in between. Um, 
Nobody really understands, I think, the type theory of Russell and Whitehead, probably because they didn't really understand it either themselves. Um, church really deserves a mention. Um, the issue of impredicativity kind of hit the world in a big way at this stage. And somehow this talk in the end is all about the significant aspects that come from dependent types. Um, so here's a, here's a slide that's intended to be contentious in some sense. Um, I guess, you know, I think it's worth thinking that type theory started as something which was something to do with the foundations of mathematics. Um, uh, it's, it's hard to know how significant historically type theory was for the foundations of mathematics. If you think of the period sort of 1910 to 1960 or something like that, um, it's not quite clear that it had such an impact. So maybe it wasn't so surprising that around 1970 everybody with a huge relief said, ah oh, no, it's, it's all right because it's good for something else, um, for programming languages and so on. Slightly more subtle question is its significance for constructive mathematics. Um, there's certainly a period of time at which a lot of people thought that it pretty much defined what constructive mathematics was. Now that's, um, that's not so clear and one wants to tread pretty carefully there. It's been turned, dependent type theory, into an amazing proof assistant. And I guess you will all know that, um, I mean, because this subject has managed to advertise itself um, in a kind of pleasingly spectacular way, um, that type theory has become something of significance again for foundations with claims made by the Univalent Foundations program. Um, so I'll just slip in a few remarks about that in the talk, but I'm not going to say too much about it. Um, I'm certainly not going to, as it were, add to the advertising copy of this. Um, but you see, I don't know that you can see it. It's kind of interesting questions about this technology. But right down the bottom, I, I say, well, not what is type theory for, but just what is it mathematically? Okay. Um, so now there are a few slides which, I mean, if you've never seen type theory before, are useless to you. And if you have seen type theory before, are useless to you because you <laughs> know the slides in any case. Okay. Um, so in type theory, you have a space of sections or universal quantification, a total space. And these are typical rules of type formation. So I'm just wandering through this, this kind of traditional world. Here's something about equality or identity types. So here I show the formation, introduction, one form of the elimination rule, um, which is almost impossible to understand when it's presented like this, but is some sophisticated form of saying that you can substitute equals for equals. Um, and here's an inductive definition so that right at the end of it, I can say that actually a traditional type theory contains these computation rules, um, and so that I can, so to speak, distinguish between that equality side and the identity predicate, um, which happened before. And the truth is that if you don't know what the difference between these things is, nothing I'm going to say in the next you know, half a minute is going to help, so I won't say it, right? Um, there, there is a, I mean, I, I, I feel, you know, I, I give up at this point because I remember, sort of 30 years ago, sitting there in talks about these things and wishing that somebody would say something intelligible about these differences and nobody said anything intelligible and eventually I got used to it and I kind of see what's going on but I still don't have anything intelligible to say about it. Okay, there. Now something about the univalence project. Um, I think it's just worth, I mean, not getting too excited about what looks like the basic ideas in this project. The idea that the identity type is something like a space of homotopies or paths 
is a terribly old idea. It goes back to Graham Siegel's observation that natural transformations look like homotopies, a kind of same basic structure. Um, the, the real stuff comes with Vovodsky's introduction of a hierarchy of types depending upon the complexity of the identity on them. And this weird thing here, which I've just written out, um, something about univalent vibrations, vibrations which try and say, somewhere over here, that essentially the equality between the fibres reflects in some hom up to homotopy faithful sense the equality down in the base. That's all it's saying. Okay, so that's enough about type theory. Um, let me say something about categorical model theory. Um, so, in a way, the difficulty for understanding this issue is the absolutely spectacular success of first-order model theory. Um, it is tremendously successful, and when you do it, you don't actually spend a great deal of time on Tarski's definition of truth because it kind of happens. In fact, you probably basically pay lip service to it because it's so obvious what's going on that you, you almost don't notice that probably you ought to say something. But if you look at other things that are formal systems or theories, I run through kind of, yeah. it's not so clear what it is to say something semantics of intuitionistic logic, of theories within, intuition, within intuitionistic logic, kind of worse whether they are theories of specific structures or, as it were, theories of sets, types, the intuitionistic world. What it is to be a model of the lambda calculus, well, uh, I, I kind of, I've been pressing a, a view about this and I've eventually written something about a, a view about this. Um, I can't say that I've successfully sold this view to people, but um, this is not a trivial matter, and it's deeply confused if you think of it in terms of first-order logic. It's, absolutely do it's an absolute disaster to think of it in terms of first-order logic. Programming languages is the kind of ditto sort of thing. I mean, there is Eugenio Moggi in the audience, there are a whole set of questions about programming languages. You don't think of them kind of as if you were a first order magician. You think of them from, you know, you grab whatever mathematical tools you can to go and get a handle on things like that. Linear logic, theories of proof about which, you know, in a way it's something of a regret that I don't say more about proof theory. This is a huge subject. It, it's a subject, it's kind of judicious of me to put it under semantics rather than categorical model theory, which is probably more or less the next slide. Just because it's not that, it's a whole collection of questions about geometry, combinatorics, and so on. So here is categorical model theory. I just say that it's a, it's a very flexible framework, and what is important about it is that in these problematic cases, it makes clear what it is to have a semantics so that you can actually prove that you've got a semantics when actually that is an issue. Um, and it makes possible, though it doesn't give you for free, a theory of models. Um, and here's just something about the main themes. This theory is represented as categories models of theories in general categories. And I've just sort of tried to write out here a kind of picture for you. You have formal sy syntax on one hand. You might have some specific semantics in the other, and they get tied together by understanding this thing in the middle. That's say you have a structured category. This is an instance of that, and you know that the structured category gives you a model of that. Um, and that has the benefit in almost all these cases that what would in principle be an induction on the structure of this 
is done once and for all by moving to here and then you move between the two. Um, so I just whip down a few examples here, higher order intuitionistic logic, programming languages, linear logic, examples of things like that. And I think perhaps I had a thing just to say that I, I don't want to over you know, I don't want to oversell the category theoretic perspective here. Best to think I, I mean, this is a very judicious journal title, Mathematical Structures in Computer Science. It, it could have been categories in computer science, and it's a good judgment that it isn't, so to speak, because it's a much broader thing. It's a much more about trying to see what the mathematical structures here. And so I just mentioned, you know, parallels to category theoretic perspectives are use of combinatorial and geometric structures in proof theory and, for example, in computer science, the use of the idea of structured operational semantics. Okay. Um, so now on to kind of understanding models for dependent types. Uh, it's worth, as it were, my just saying that very early on there was an attempt to do this about 1979 by Bob Seeley. He said, well, it's just locally Cartesian closed categories, isn't it? Um, it's absolutely perhaps, you know, it, it, it was a good thing to say. It's the right kind of category theoretic instinct. You think you have the structure on your, on your bookshelf already. You pull off the book and say, isn't this just what you want? And it's very nearly what you want, but it isn't what you want. And for a long time, nobody did that much about it, to be honest. I don't think we really understood it. We probably still don't really understand what it is we really want here. Um, so now, I, now, if you don't particularly want the categories, you pick up your copy of the local newspaper and read quietly what's been going on in the streets of Pisa last night. Um, here's, here's a picture of models of type theory. This is ancient history. Um, I mean, it, it's been kind of floated again in, in recent times, but this dates back, <coughs> what, 25 years or something, perhaps a bit longer. Um, the point is, you have some category, and the category is morally the category of types and the functions, but in, uh, the maps in the category one calls them, are you know, to represent the, the terms of the type theory. And then uh, it's very typical of this kind of thing in that, that you, you it, this categorical perspective isn't some sort of simple, naive translation. You overload structure here. So some of the maps serve also to describe dependent types. And they sit in here and they're squareable simply because you can substitute terms into types. And these are some technical points which are not irrelevant, but um, I'll skip what they mean. But the basic meaning then is that if you've got an object, it's a type. If you've got a function, it's something in this category, a map, a morphism, whatever, then it's, it's like a, a declaration term declaration. But equally, the same map in principle, if it's, a, if it's a special map, is also handling the idea of a type declaration in context here. And then there's a big issue with, with all this, which um, despite really my Etty being in the audience, I'm going to kind of sweep under the carpet, um, because categories don't provide models for type theory just for free in this kind of way because there's a huge question about coherence. The typical category will not substitute um, by pullback in the way in which, um, in which we substitute by pullback in, in logic. You'll only do it up to isomorphism. Up, up to isomorphism is a highly problematic business because things can be isomorphic in more than one way. And unless you've taken care of that kind of thing, you're not being honest. So, on the other hand, um, 
being honest costs quite a lot of work. <laughs> so I won't be honest in this, um, in this talk, except in so far as to say that I'm not being honest. Okay. Um, but it's worth bearing in mind because people will try and pull the wool over your eyes about this. That's, I don't know if that expression translates very readily into Italian, but <laughs> probably not. Um, so it kind of comes from a sheep rearing country or something. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's a picture of, what, of the vibration view of this. It's not quite clear which of the versions of thinking about this as a special collection of maps living in the collection of all maps here works best and actually I don't know but what's important is that the fibre over one here should essentially look as the same thing here and there's a it's uh, even that is a subtle point in that it's not just that there's some arbitrary isomorphism but there's some isomorphism that's canonically given by maps here and things like that um, I don't want to spend too much time on that so the quantification, the pi and sigma, um, this is quite subtle in the sense that it's a hard thing to have because function spaces are hard to get and that's a right adjoint. This is, so to speak, subtle because it's, in brackets, so easy to get so that you kind of wonder whether you may not have cheated to some extent in this. Um, but when you have a total space, you, you're just really composing maps. Um, uh, I just put this down because the axiom of choice in this form, I mean, it's always said uh, this is a theorem of type theory. Um, so this is readable as the axiom of choice. For all A, there is a B. So there is an F which takes the A's to B's such that for all A, this. Um, uh, it's an interesting thing. I mean, you just, you, you always just say, well, the axiom of choice is true. But actually, the subtle point is that these two types really should be isomorphic. It's not a, um, it's not a, that, that's not a comfortable remark within the context of homotopy type theory because isomorphism, it, isn't homotopy, so I leave that thought floating in the ether, I think. Um, identity types, I'll, I'll come back to, to a question about exactly how problematic this interpretation is in a moment. Um, here's a modern view which hides the thought that the identity types should be weak omega groupoids, which you will also see in some literature, which says that actually What's important is to have a factorization of maps um, into something here. I mean, perhaps I'll just say in words what this is. Um, this sometimes said to be somehow I don't know, homotopy fiber or something like that. Um, this is morally the set of B and A such that F of B is equal to A. Um, written out in type theory and sitting here. And that map here, therefore, is a dependent type over A. And this map, borrowing from the language of homotopy theory, is an acyclic or trivial co-fibration because it has some lifting property relative to that map, which is kind of automatic in, um, in standard type theory. Now I'm going to talk about polynomials. So, uh, let's just check how I'm doing for time here. Mm -hmm. We must press on. So a polynomial is a polynomial is a map of sets. But you think of it as S, as a collection of operations and P of S the fibre over S is the arity of the operation. So if you were doing ordinary standard logic, P of S would be finite, but there's no particular reason to make it so. And then the functor that corresponds to that 
just forms all the naive terms, not all the terms, but the, the, the terms of level one in variables x from this. So it's this sum, sum s of s, this. So you sort of see something which is, which is going now to be a part of the theme of the talk. Um, just, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. You sort of see a sigma, and then this is a function space. So there's a sigma pi here. Okay. Um, I just mentioned that it's in terms of polynomial functors that the usual type theory gets its so-called W types, because the W types are just essentially the terms, the kind of iterated terms in this um, for this signature on the basis of something or other. So somehow that's basically all it is. Um, there's a bi-category of these things which I've sort of... Um, so I think this bi-category I really discovered with Nicola Gambino about ten years ago. Um, and uh, in order to... I'm just showing you kind of the simplest form of composition in the bi-category. So what I've got is a polynomial functor, and then I take a polynomial functor of the polynomial functor, like that. And so it's a sigma of a function. So by the axiom of choice... No. Sorry. This, this sigma stays here. It's a function of a sigma. Let me try that. That sigma stays, but this function of a sigma becomes a sigma of the f's from here to here in this type. And then you get that. So the axiom of choice just shows you that this, is, that this composition works. And I've written out the details here. I've absolutely no idea why I bothered to write it down, because I guess it's completely incomprehensible in, in real time. Um, Okay, I don't need those um, things. But what we do need to do in order to understand this talk at all is to understand ma maps of polynomials. So this is really weird. Here are two polynomials. And a map between them is a perfectly honest map here and then something really strange. This, you take the pullback of here and you map it back in that direction. Okay. If you see this in the literature, people will say, well, this corresponds to natural transformations, blah, 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 blah. What is really going on is this. Here's an explanation of what the maps are about. So you, you think that you want to go from this to this. So this it was a so here's a polynomial goes to u, here's a polynomial, y goes to v. So what maps of this kind must exist? Well, it's a map between some sigma to some other sigma, so as it were, the natural maps must send you, decide which of these things to send you here. So you have to send that. Just imagine that this is a set theoretic sum. How could you define a map? The only way you could do it really is to decide for each of these sums into which sum to send this natural way. But then when you've done that, you've got to map from here to here. A to the x of u to a to the y, f of u. And the only way, as it were, you can simply do that, to map from this function to this function, is to map that to that. And that's what you're doing. So that is, I mean, the maps come from that Thing. And what that tells you, that this is kind of highfalutin category theory, so to speak, is that when you've got a vibration, a an index family of categories or whatever, this polynomials in it is essentially obtained by taking the opposite category and freely adding sums to it. And that's this formula here, which I'll come back to right at the end of the talk. Okay, so it's an extraordinary fact um, uh, that 
basically, in good cases, this category here is Cartesian closed. It's an absolutely extraordinary fact. The first time you see it, it was proved in a paper by here. It's not quite so extraordinary a fact as that because the calculations are already in work which originated from Burke, Dahl and Rossellini on a related model to this. Um, and it has something to do with understanding what functions into a sum look like. Um, so I, I think I'll just leave that as a, as a fact. I'm not going today to explain why it is. So here's, um, if you get a Cartesian closed category, you know, the enthusiastic type theorist wants to know whether R has this given me a model of type theory. Uh, I, mean, I mean, the answer is, of course, at some level, completely no. Um, but actually, the trouble is that the answer is yes. But for a very peculiar reason. Let's say if I've got any Cartesian closed category, there is a model for type theory in which index types are completely constant. So they're given by project projections. This is an extraordinarily stupid model. But it's still a model. It even has identity types. You, know, you have the identity on A cross A is A cross A. It's everything. Um, so uh, the identity in this world is rather spectacular. Right? Everything's equal to, I mean, it's sort of like a religion or something. Everything's equal to everything else. Um, but it's there. That tells us something about whether actually what we're saying about models of type theory is really so smart. Um, right? um, so that's not, somehow that's the wrong question. The right question is, can you do something sensible? Um, uh, so this is what something sensible roughly means. And the answer, this is highly non-trivial. The answer is, it was found by a student in Cambridge tomorrow on the Glen. And the answer is yes, in this case. There is a, there is an, a way of extend. You see, what happens is, you have this thing, you do this extraordinary stuff, but you're still fibred over C. And now you've got to do something which, you know, maybe the earliest time things of this thing were done was by, in kind of Robinson Rossellini on, um, you know, extending models for System F and things like this. Um, you have some base category, but you've got to change the base category when you ex change the things in the fibres. Um, it's a non-trivial activity. Um, this case is different from that case, but it's still not completely evident that it's true. And when Tamara first did this, it was 20 pages of calculations to show that it's true. Uh, nowadays, we can probably explain it in a slightly more nuanced way, but it's still not a trivial fact. That this this is true. Okay. Right. Now I'm going to say something about functional extensionality. How am I doing for time? Yeah, just about. Okay. Um, here, for all a, f of a is equal to g a, so f is equal to g. Okay. That's functional extensionality. You have many equivalent formulations of that idea in type theory. What's it about? Well, there's a general issue, which is this. You have a whole set of type constructors in type theory. And the point about the type constructors is that they tell you what the elements of the type are. Typical type T. But then the question is, do they determine what the identity on the type is? And that's a really weird question because the identity on the type is itself a type constructor, given the type theory. So I won't, as it were, overstress the anxieties that can be created by that, but that is a very anxious moment. Um, we know, after all, what on earth is going on here because these types secretly should carry the structure of a weak omega groupoid. So there are two views that, I mean, there are actually three, I see three views, yes. <laughs> right. um, there's the homotopy type th theory view, which is 
kind of univalence says everything's identified as much as it possibly could be, so the identities somehow should be as rigid as possible. I wanted an analogy that's a bit like thinking about the constructal sets or something like that, I think. Yeah? The pure type theory view is the rules determine the type, so nothing more should be true of identities than has to be. That's a kind of free set theory view. And you can see that I'm just kind of irritating person here. Um, since I'm just talking about models of type theory, I don't have to take, as it were, the foundational. I'm not taking the foundational question on board. There are lots of different models, so I don't really care about this issue. The good question is, is there an issue? Well, and there is an issue because in the univalence world, and there is a model, albeit described kind of insanely complicatedly, um, there is a model for univalence, and univalence sa implies functional extensionality. So there are models in which this extensionality holds. Of course, you kind of know there are models of the sets is a model in which this thing holds, right? Um, but functional extensionality fails in polynomial models. Um, it's not quite clear how well we understand this fact. That's a calculation at the moment, and it's not a calculation because these, these maps coming backwards in these polynomials are really difficult to control. It's not a calculation that's easy to do. Um, uh, and it's not clear what it's got to do with anything, so I'm just going to tell you what it's vaguely got to do with is something to do with the dialectic interpretation. So here is the dialectic interpretation, the formulas of heighting arithmetic, uh, translated into things like that, where you see this, there exists for all combination. The crucial step is this traditional way of moving from here to here provides you with a map from the u's to the v's and a map from the u cross y's to the x's and you suddenly see some vague hint of that business about going backwards. Here is a variant dialectica model. It consists of n not now two sets but three sets um, and essentially maps from u to v from y back to x and then from a on to b again but kind of actually written in type theory in this way. What's the categorical interpretation of it? Well, you take a, a fibred thing. If you're just doing this over something, rather not trying to make this type theory or anything, you take products, you freely add products, then you freely add sums. And so you can see that there's a weird phenomenon. The dialectica vibration here is essentially, by this calculation, polynomials squared. I take sigma of the opposite of sigma of the opposite and this is just a calculation in logic. <laughs> That's equal to that. It's kind of weird that the dial this variant dialectic interpretation has a sort of square root. A delicate point is connected with what happens when you do this expanding out of the base which I'll just, I think, skip in the interest of getting to the end of the talk. So last slide, some things for the future. There are other interpretations of this general style. There's Dylan Arm, celebrated interpretation. There's the interpretation which uh, Pino Rossellini and I and a whole group of people ended up discovering in Copenhagen. Um, this idea, I'd call it, this is a kind of a kind of embarrassing joke, but young people will have their way. Um, lots of things to do in this area, to compare and contrast these kinds of models, to develop tools for calculations, because actually it's incredibly difficult to calculate these things at the moment, and to create a model theory, um, because actually we're just at the start of all that. So, you see, I end with exactly the title. It's a question about models for type theory. And that's it. Question. Questions, comments? Wait. 
you didn't say anything about impredicativity, what uh, categorical model have to uh, say on that. Uh, um, yes, okay. I'm not quite sure, to be honest, how, I mean, how helpful categorical models are for understanding it, to be honest. Um, I mean, they're all categorical models, as you very well <laughs> know, because you basically first recognize this fact. Um, uh, for, I mean, for system F, and then, you know, for the whole calculus of constructions, which is highly impredicative. Um, I mean, exactly what you get out of being able to do that, that you don't out of playing with the system, I'm not so sure. Um, I mean, uh, uh, you know, if you've got a collection of types, you want to have a type, you want to have something which, you know, in some sense, fibers these types. You, we know what we've got to do in order to do these things, but, um, but the information about the issues between predicativity and impredicativity. I, d I don't know. I mean, what do you think? Not sure. Millie maybe has a... You, you. <laughs> we can ask Millie. Millie. She has a question. About impredicativity? No, no, no whatever. <laughs> Sorry. I would like to ask you about uh, your... Um, if you give us the intuition uh, in your polynomial categories, uh, what is uh, intuitively the, the interpretation of the propositional equality versus the equality between terms, the definitional one. So if you can give you the intuition, and uh, this is one question, and the second question, I would very much interested to know if you can put this machinery on a realizability uh, model, like you take uh, uh, Clini, and you do the Cartesian categories by doing functional extensionality on the, the base category of Cartesian closed, then you do this machinery of polynomials. As far as understood, you destroy functional extensionality there. So it would be very important for me to do this machinery with come back in your in the towards realizability models where we can extract pr programs for proofs. Because it's very difficult to model uh, Martin Leff type theory in uh, realizability model. This is a big uh, question that I have. So I was wondering first uh, the intuition between uh, the interpretation of extension of um, sorry, propositional equality versus the definition of one, and second, if you can connect to realizability model as the, your effective topos. This is to be predicative, of course. Thank you. <laughs> um. <laughs> Let, let me see about, about e e equality, because um, if I, I, mean, I think you have to imagine that we're in a situation, I and mean, this, this polynomial model basically takes any s uh, model of type theory with slightly crude features at the moment, um, because slightly crude features, there's an issue, I mean, at, at the moment, probably because of lack of work and intelligence and things like that, um, the model works for having rather strong co-products around. Um, so, uh, actually, most models do have that, but, it, but there's, there's still an issue. Um, I mean, it takes any model for type theory and will give you another model for t type theory. So perhaps the right thing to do is to th imagine that you start with something which is a locally Cartesian closed category. So, as it were, it's a model with a disastrous equality at, at, at some level. Um, uh, and suddenly, I'm going to destroy functional exten extensionality. Um, right. Okay. So. All the work happens in the stuff coming back. So, if I think about the, um, I mean, I, I've got these, so say, two sets. 
um, so to speak, the original stuff and, and the map into it, which is this collection of, as it were, things that I, additional data that I'm having to account for. In the original data, nothing happens. The, 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 um, the equality um, for the, the, the equality for functions in that part just looks crude like the, the, the thing that we started from. But what happens in the backwards case is that the actual equal says these two f's are literally equal. Right? I mean, so, you know, it's, it's, as it were, a physical equality of, in this model. On the other hand, in the identity type, the natural picture of the identity type gives you two choices of, of as it were, a justification coming back. And the, the identity is happy to take either case. So the external, the equal sign equality is, is very harsh, it's just equal. The identity type says, actually, you've got a choice. I don't mind which, I don't mind which justification you give Sloan to give me one or other of these justifications. So it's, 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 it's very strange. Um, it's, it's not, in, it's not in, the, in the basic thing. It's somehow this picture of what this... I, I'm justifying the extra data and you're, you've got a freedom to do that. But I, I, that's a very, I, I don't know that that's really a, a good... I mean, I'm not really answering your question there. You had another question, which I... I a realizability. Depends what you mean by a realizability. I mean, do you have a model which is a model of type theory? No. Yeah. You see, this isn't going. This isn't going to produce you at the moment. It's not going to climb up to get a model of type theory. Uh, it's possible that if we, I mean, this I think is is a real prospect that if you marry realizability and this and and do them in parallel. That you could you could do something. I, I can believe that that's the case. Um, I think that would be an interesting thing to try. But it's not it's not going to be a magic wand to solve the realizability problems that, that you have. Okay. More questions? Well, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.